Hello, my name is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Welcome to this episode of Preservation Oaks. In this series, we introduce you to yet another extraordinary organization serving their community by conserving and preserving our heritage. It could be an organization in your community, in your county, or in your state. Now sit back and relax and enjoy the program. This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe from Salt Lake City. Today's Preservation Oak is Christy Deitmeyer, the hardworking manager of the Dyersville Area Historical Society, and man, she is always busy. Christy's been involved in education for 30 years. She is uh, educating still at the Historical Society, but in a different way, by teaching people about history and doing genealogical research for people, she started at the museum about four years ago, and then last year she started at the office. Um, Christy's a, obviously a resident of the Dyersville city, and um, she has three adult children. Christy, welcome to the show. Hi, Sean. Christy, first of all, I want to say how beautiful your area of the country is. I went on uh, Google Earth and looked around the town. There's a lot of really beautiful houses, large houses even, Beside your beautiful museum, the House Museum, I like the one on 1st Avenue and 6th Street. It has a round Victorian turret, a big porch. It's really nice. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Um, I think I do, yep. Yeah, it's a really nice house. The um, Dyer House is really fabulous. Uh, you have pictures on your website of the internals and so on. It's, it's very nice. I also recognize that the businesses downtown are very diverse. You have what would be expected, of course, in any uh, downtown, like banks and so on, but I ran across a, a haberdashery, and I haven't seen one of those or even heard of one of those for years and years. So that, that struck me as pretty cool. For those of you who don't know, a haberdashery is a men's clothing store. Is that right? Yes, yes. It opened um, just this year. Oh, yeah, wonderful. I hope they stay in business. Hey, Christy, when was the area settled, Dyersville? Um, residents came here around the eight, late 1840s. Um, the town was incorporated in 1872. Okay, why is it called Dyersville? Um, it's called Dyersville because James Dyer came here from England back in 1848 with his wife and three kids, okay. and they settled in this area. He was instrumental in bringing the railroad to town. He was instrumental in establishing a lot of the businesses. He bought a lot of the land in the area, um, and then he built uh, businesses and got people to come into town to help settle it. Cool. What is the business of the community? What was it, and what is it today? Um, it's agriculture-related. Okay. Um, we have some manufacturing companies. We have uh, feed stores, we have banks, the businesses on Main Street, restaurants, things like that. Cool. I know you have a river, and I'm really going to butcher this name, but it's called North Fork Makoketa? Is that? Makoketa. Makoketa. Okay. I knew I was going to butcher that. So the Makoketa, North Fork Makoketa River runs through Dyersville. You have agricultural barge activity on the river? No, it's not a very deep or wide river. Okay. Um, it flows into the Makokata, which is a bigger um, portion of it, branch of it. 
but sometimes it's only like a foot deep in places. Okay. So, but way back when it would have been a water source. Obviously, if we have flooding, source. then, you know, it's higher, but mainly it's kayaks and people take inner tubes on it. That's about the only recreation that you can do. Right. Back, back in the day, though, was it suitable for, like, running a mill with water? Yes. Actually, James Dyer was instrumental. Um, he actually built a mill pond north of town, and he got the river to flow two different directions, to his mill to provide energy wow. uh, for the his mill and for kind of for the community area. That's pretty smart. Two different directions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think he was a pretty good businessman. Sounds like it. Uh, you also have a farm toy museum there in your area. What's that all about? And does the society have any partnership with that? The museum ha it has information on the history of our Ertl toy company. They manufactured the die-cast toy tractors. That's what our community used to be known for. If you mentioned you were from Dyersville, people had heard of the Ertl Company. That company started 75 years ago in the basement of their home in Dubuque, and then they moved to Dyersville and started their factory here. They have lots of farm toy collections on display, and they obviously have a lot of tourism, people that come through. They also are part of our National Farm Toy Show that we have every November, and they promote the industry of farm toys and the collections. Our partnership, not really a lot, but we promote them, and they help promote us oh, good. in different aspects. I nearly forgot to ask, Dyersville has a famous movie set in the area where the Field of Dreams movie was filmed. Now, what can you tell yep, us the about film, that? It was filmed over 30 years ago um, here in our community oh, and the local and surrounding long. areas. Some in, scenes were in Dubuque and Galena, Illinois. It's been, like I said, over 30 years and people still come. The, the large numbers of tourists come into town just to see the the site and play catch and run the bases. Wow. It sure doesn't seem like 30 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Did you get to meet Kevin Costner? No, I didn't. I've met Dwyer Brown, but I did not get to meet Kevin Costner. Oh, that's too bad. I didn't go to the game, so. Well, that's great. So that's a big draw for the community. That's good. Um, there's a large basilica in the area, too. I think it's called St. Francis Xavier in Dyersville, and I tell you, that is absolutely beautiful and really well maintained. Do you know when it yes. was built? Um, it was built in 1888. The congregation outgrew the first church that was built here in 1858, and um, they decided they needed a bigger church, so they got the funds together and built the bigger, the larger parish. And it has beautiful artwork, statues and the paintings, we had a local priest that was here back in the two years of 2000, early 2000s, that he had everything repainted and restored. It became air-conditioned to help preserve it. Wow. We're just very fortunate. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. Yeah, I tell you, I, I see buildings like that, basilicas like that, or, or big churches, let's say. There's very few basilicas, from what I understand. But I see big churches like that, but they're not maintained as well. That, that is absolutely beautiful. So anybody out there who wants to go to Dyersville and see the Basilica, uh, there are very few across the country, and uh, it's just gorgeous. I noticed in Dyersville, as I was going through there, that there, there was like a German state bank and there's like European and perhaps German names in the towns in the area, like Luxembourg and New Vienna. And I noticed a building uh, that had the German State Bank on it. Were people of German heritage sort of the founders? Was Mr. Dyer a, founder, a German person? Um, actually, Mr. Dyer came here from England. Um, he was an English Protestant. Came here, bought up the land. They had, there was quite a few Englishmen that started uh, the community. And then the Germans had settled to the north of us at New Vienna, and then eventually some of them came into town and settled here. Okay. So we had German mercantiles and English mercantiles kind of right next to each other, and oh, eventually wow. the English moved on, um, moved to the west in different communities, and then we became pre predominantly German Catholic. 
We have a few Irish Catholics that came in and built the railroad, and they liked the community and ended up staying here. Oh, nice. So that's how we have some of our Irish Catholics in town. You but we are predominantly German. Do you celebrate the German heritage of your town in any way? You know, it's interesting. We do not celebrate the German, but we do celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Um, we have a big parade and stuff in the park and music and big celebrations. So I ran across a historical kind of, society the other day that was telling me that they really, really love to celebrate Oktoberfest. And it occurred to okay. me that, that your town, having German heritage, you know, might also do that. Do you guys celebrate Oktoberfest? Um, the Historical Society doesn't, but we do have a brewery in town that's called Textile Brewery. Okay. And they have Oktoberfest on a weekend, and they have different people dressed in the German attire and um, obviously drink their German beer and have a good time, I guess. I've never went to it, but... Yep. Sounds like a lot of fun. I wouldn't either unless they had Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not I think you can probably get yourself something like that. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful town. Can you please provide the audience with an overview of the society, the communities you served? I notice it's called the area, you know, the Dyersville Area Historical Society. And, and I'm curious about what, why you put that in the name. Because we're here to preserve the history of the local communities in the western Dubuque County. So we're at the edge of the Dubuque County area. Okay. Dubuque County has a historical society in the city of Dubuque. And then we also have a couple other smaller historical societies in some of the other towns. I think we're the only ones that actually have an office where people can come in and do genealogical research. Some of the other ones have like museums that you can contact them and you can go in and see um, the information that they have. We just kind of provide more stuff, I guess, more, more artifacts for the area. Right. Well, you've got a lovely house, and I think it's right across the street from your office. And I, it I, is. I believe your office is located in the Memorial Building. What is that building? Um, the Memorial Building is owned by the city of Dyersville, okay. and it has the city offices, the city clerk, where they do all of their council stuff. The police department is in here. Public Works, uh, our Park and Recs department um, is located here, as well as our offices. Okay. You personally were involved in education for 30 years. Is that what led you to history as, uh, you know, an interest in history? Have you always had that? Yeah, I've always enjoyed, you know, the history. Growing up, I always enjoyed listening to my grandma talk about how things were when, you know, she was growing up. And, you know, my parents always related a lot of things about when they grew up and what it was like. I was kind of looking for a part-time job um, with being off in the summertime. Yeah. So I took the job at the museum just to fill my hours. My kids were getting older and the activities weren't as many. So I kind of was looking for something, and that happened to become available, and I applied for it and got the position. Well, I'm sure you're very good at it. As you got into the position, you had an opportunity to sort of go through the records and the artifacts, and you started doing genealogical research for people. Um, did you run across any funny or interesting stories from the records? Um, yeah, it's interesting to read some of the older obituaries, you know, like it wasn't just their name at the, the top. It would say local Dyersville businessman succumbs to, you know, the call of death or answers the call of death. Oh. And they're just, it's funny, the headlines that they had in them. Yeah, we just yesterday, they had a couple articles that we kind of read over and laughed about and just some of the things that they used to do or the way it was said. And it was always, it's always kind of interesting to find those things. Oh, fantastic. Um, I know your building, the Memorial Building, is right next to the library, the James Kennedy Library. And as I was doing some research, um, several times I had several newspaper articles. And this was like, I want to say 2017 or so. But they said, you know, the, the employees uh, believed it was haunted. They had to call in, I guess, psychics or whoever to try and root out the, the cause of the ghostly activity. 
Um, did you hear anything about that? Yeah, I remember reading about it, that they had some people come in and they like, I don't know if they stayed overnight and brought in their different machines or whatever they used to see if it was, if it was there, but I, I didn't really follow up on any of that. Okay. I wondered if they finally got whatever it was out. Yeah, I'm not real sure. I haven't heard any more about it, so I'm not, I'm not sure whatever happened with it. Okay. So it's not like a famous story within the town or anything? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I know everybody today, COVID and, and people not being able to get together and volunteer properly for historical societies, that kind of thing, everybody's kind of squeezed and it's a challenge. What are your funding goals at the society? What, do you, what is your strategy? What do you need most? Um, we're very fortunate. We live in the community we do. Our city is very supportive of our organization. Some of the area businesses are very generous when we do our membership drive every year. Very generous donations. Uh, we do apply for grants Good. when we have a project to you know, help sustain what we're, what we're doing and what our mission is. We do charge an admission for our museum, Good. and then we ask for donations when we do the research for the people. So that kind of helps sustain us and keep us going. What is the cost of doing, if somebody's listening to this broadcast and they have relatives that they need to research in the area, what's that like? If you come into the office to do research, we basically ask you to make a donation. If we make copies for you, we ask you to help pay for the cost of that. If you're a member, we charge you 25 cents a copy. If you're non-member, we charge you 50 cents a copy. And then we just ask you to make a donation. And people are very generous. I got a check in the mail today from someone. I had sent some information about one of the businesses that were in town. I found some ads out of the paper, sent them to them, and they sent us a check. Yeah. So it just, it just depends. You know, but people are very, very appreciative of what we can supply them, and then they're very generous with us. Yeah, I think it's only right that if you're asking for help from a historical society, and you have to realize all of the work that goes on behind the scenes where you're digging through files and books and so on, it's only right that you make a donation or join the society, that kind of thing, and support it. Right, and people, like I said, we've been, we're very... We're very fortunate. People are very supportive of, of our organization. Oh, fantastic. So beyond the proceeds from managing the Dyer Botsford House Museum, what other things do you do within, you know, besides genealogical and what we've discussed? Are, is there anything else that brings in funds? Are you selling books or coins or any of that? Well, I've been doing a lot of cleaning here at the office and over at the Dyer House. Just excess stuff, you know, excess books. Like, we don't need five copies of the same book on our shelf. Oh, right. So I, I was able to sell a lot of those items. We also have many dolls donated to our doll museum. Yeah. And if they're excess or they're similar to what we already have, we will sell those. We go to the National Farm Toy Show. We have a booth there. And we sell anything that we have that's agriculture related. That's fantastic. Or we sell the dolls. People, unfortunately, people aren't buying dolls like they used to, but we still, we still can sell quite a few dolls there. We just cleaning out stuff. We did a porch sale in June this year, and we raised quite a bit of money that way. And then we also host Victorian teas through tour, tour groups. The chamber lines them up for us. And then we put on a Victorian tea, and we have a volunteer that dresses like Ann Dyer and tells you what it was like to immigrate here back in 1848. Are you, are you having those teas in that house? Yes. Oh, yep. that's fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a, neat, a neat thing. You know, we serve English scones and tea and little finger sandwiches and other types of desserts that they serve mm. and fruit. And then we usually give tour, you know, then they get a tour of the house with the cost of the tea. We do have some people that just come just for tours. They don't do a Victorian tea, which is, you know, fine also. But, you know, just anything we can do to get people into the society, you know, into the house to see it. Right. Do you do any tours of the area? 
Like, are, do you, you know, do you take people and, and go to the various buildings and describe the history, you know, that kind of thing upon request? Um, no, I don't think we've ever done that. We have a volunteer. Well, she was actually the manager before I took the position. She has done presentations on some of our businesses. Yeah. And it was at our library, you know, in conjunction with the library. And she would put on a presentation about the history of the 100 block of Main Street. What's our 100 block? So she's block? done, I think she's done three of them now. Uh, with COVID, we didn't do one last year. Yeah. I'm hoping to convince her to do one next year. What is a 100 um, walk? Next. You mentioned the history, we, the history of a 100 walk. What is that? The hun- like the 100 block of the building. So we have, oh, we have oh. the 100 block, the 200 block, and the 300 block of our main street. Okay. All from the bridge to the Memorial Hall. Yeah. So she will take each business and take it down to when the building was built, who built the building, and what businesses have been in that building. Yeah, because buildings and, and things that were built over 100 years ago now are you know, fast disappearing from the landscape. Right, and it's it's kind of interesting how, like, the business would be in one building, but then they would move to the next building. So mm-hmm. I don't know if, like, the rent changed. You know, they leased the building, so then they would just move to another building, yeah. move their business. And it's just kind of interesting to hear the different businesses that have been in all of the different buildings. It's got to be monetary or budget that drives that, right? I would think so. And that was, you know, back in the early late 1890s, 1900s, you know, that's kind of when we saw more of that. Now businesses pretty much go into the building and stay in that building. We yeah. don't have that anymore. Yeah. I want to ask you about COVID-19, um, not only how it's affecting your society, but also how it's affecting the community. What can you tell me about that? Um, well, it, it affected our tourism. You know, we didn't have the tours last year. The state of Iowa was locked down where we were not allowed to open certain businesses, certain museums, you know, we could not open, you know, so the numbers were just not there. People were not touring probably until, you know, later in the fall, we started seeing a little more of it. That, that was huge. You know, it hurt some of our area restaurants. They ended up closing, you know, it just, the numbers were not there. Yeah. What about your volunteers? Did that decrease? Did what decrease? Your volunteers for the society? Yeah, I had volunteers that were not comfortable um, coming in, you know, and doing tours. Our Actually, our historical office was closed. I don't think we opened back up until, like, June. We were probably closed March, April, and May last year. So, you know, so then we didn't have people coming in. I still did research for them and would send it to them or email it to them but we didn't have people into the office to do you know to do any volunteering or to come in and do any research our city hall building was closed you know they weren't allowing people into it until you know things got released covid sort of went away or got better and now it seems to be growing again with this delta variant is that are you still under lockdown No, we actually are open. Our governor is not allowing things to lock down. The schools, you know, there's controversy about the mask mandates. You know, we have some some businesses that still require you to wear a mask. Our library, they want you to wear a mask inside. You know, it just kind of depends on the organization and the business. Right. You know, some of the workers that are in some of the businesses are wearing masks. It, It just varies. From business to business. Here in Salt Lake, we're still, you know, I go to some businesses just like you, and there's no mask at all, not even on the employees. And others have a big sign on the door, you must wear a mask. So I never know which is which until I get to the door. Right. And I think that's kind of how we are here. And, you know, more people, you know, obviously last year wore the mask a lot more. Now we see few people, like at church or in the grocery store, there are people still wearing masks. Yeah. Our vaccination numbers are very, you know, vary from individual to individual, you know, an area to area. You know, some people are, areas are more vaccinated than others. And it's just, 
I was talking with a historical. Kind of hard to know. I was talking with a historical society from Kailua, uh, Hawaii, and they're up to seventy some over seventy percent vaccinated in Kailua. Wow. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, I'm not sure what we are here. I know I get updates from the state, but I haven't read them lately. Yeah, I don't know what our numbers. My husband last year told me I had to quit listening to the thoughts in the news and listening to everything. <laughs> so yeah, it can have I had a, a lot of time on my hands because school was locked down and we weren't, you know, I wasn't going to work, so I wasn't as busy and I had more time to look at that stuff. So yeah. I've this got year another I haven't uh, had time to do it. I got another historical society that actually has on their website an appeal asking for members and the public in their town to write their history of COVID or how it's affected them and they intend to pull all that together at some point. Oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, we put together a binder about COVID. We actually, one of the volunteers went back and pulled out information from the 1918 and 1919 pandemic oh, that yeah. we had. Oh, yeah. So she pulled out a lot of stuff, you know, from the newspapers. And then, like, we went through and we looked at obituaries, people who had died during that time. Yeah. And we kind of pulled out some that said, like, if they died of pneumonia or they died from the Spanish flu we pulled out those obituaries and put them in a binder together. And then she did the same thing for the COVID added all of like people that we knew from the area that had passed away of COVID. She put those obituaries in this binder and yeah, you're right on it. That's great. You mentioned earlier about education and the fact that when you came to the historical society, you still do education um, what kind of outreach and education does the society undertake within the community? Well, we developed a curriculum in 2019 that we were hoping to get the school age kids to come and do tours. Yeah. But then COVID hit last year in March. We had some schools scheduled to come in May to tour. And so we haven't been able to do that just with the COVID numbers you know, and the schools aren't comfortable with it. So I'm hoping when things settle down, we can get those school-age kids to come back in. So our curriculum is based off of our Iowa core curriculum that we have through the state. And we looked at it and pulled, okay, this is what we're, you're going to talk about at home, at school before you come see us. And then we are going to show you the difference in how the telephone has evolved over the years, right. how what you have now as a in your kitchen compared to what they had back in the 1800s, just to kind of do those correlations of things, how things have changed over the years. So we have a curriculum developed. So hopefully, maybe next year when things aren't as you know crazy with COVID, we'll be able to do more of that and with get your- the students in and. With your background, that has to be, that's going to be really great. As soon as yeah, I think it'll be good. We, um, we have a volunteer. She actually lives in Colorado. She's a former resident of our community, and she is a retired educator. And she helped us develop that curriculum by, you know, researching and putting things together. And oh, that's fantastic. By what we have at the house and how we could, you know, the correlation between the, the different things. You've got so, all these members. we can do it. you got all these members of the society. How do you keep them informed? I mean, you have like a, a strategy, albeit scaled down because of COVID and, and its impact. But how do you keep your members informed and, and the community informed of your progress against the strategy? Do you have a newsletter or how does that work? We have a newsletter that goes out every March. It's kind of our membership drive, membership newsletter. We send it to people who are on our list, you know, who have been past members. Or I collect names, you know, as people we do research for them. I collect their addresses, and then we send them to them. We started doing the area businesses, getting them to be members. We have a business membership, and then we have a personal membership okay. that we do. And we had a very good response from the businesses uh, this oh, last year. Great. They really supported us and 
you know, we ask them to make donations then, and a lot of them do. You know, well, some just pay their membership, but then a lot of them will include a member or a donation for our organization also. We also do a Facebook page, so I can kind of keep posting on there. You know, we painted the wrought iron fence that's around the Dyer house. So we, I posted pictures when we did that. I and, saw those. In, when we get a grant, you know, we'll post information about that, you know, just to kind of, you know, do those kinds of things, too. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, we've got to take our first break now, Christy, for a few minutes. Um, okay. Listeners, we'll be right back after these important words. Hello, listeners. I hope you are doing well and staying safe. You know, individual members provide the foundation of support on which all of MicroStream Radio's success is built. Your generosity helps keep us on the air with great programs. We rely on listeners like you. If you listen to the great programs here on MicroStream Radio, now is the time to show your support. It's a smart investment. As our membership grows and revenues increase, more great programs come back to you. Please take just a few moments to become a member today by going to www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. We thank you so much for being here and for your support today. This is Dr. Paul Brennan, president of the Kailua Historical Society in Hawaii. And I love listening to Sean Thomas Radcliffe on MicroStream Radio. If you have a society in your area, then please support them with both your volunteer time and your funding. It makes a huge difference. The more support a society has, the more they can benefit the community in terms of providing records for family research and education for the public and students in K-12 through grades. They can fund a museum or sponsor historical and fun events for the public in order to tell your story. Maintaining a society makes a huge difference in a community. Please don't wait. Show your support for your local historical or genealogical society today. They preserve our heritage and culture for existing and future children of all ages. Thank you. This is your queen. Do you want to be an official member of Preservation Oaks? Of course you do, you silly bugger. Just go to patreon.com backslash microstreamradio and become a Patreon. Do it right away. I command it. Take a minute. See what's in it. When you're buying a vitamin product, read the label. Make sure you get all the vitamins recommended by government experts. You do in VIMS and three essential minerals also. Get VIMS at your druggist. VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. VIMS. Hello to everyone across the world. I hope you're doing well and enjoying the program. Your support is a direct and vital investment in the programs that MicroStream Radio provides throughout the year. Whatever programs you enjoy remain alive and on the air thanks to contributions from generous donors like you. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Please take a few moments and show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. Your support allows us to bring you more unique and increasingly valuable content. We thank you so much. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe, and we are here today with Christy Deitmeyer from the Dyersville Area Historical Society, located in Dyersville, Iowa. We're going to learn more now, uh, or continue our discussion about the Society's role in the community, and especially records or collections that the Society maintains for the public and their members. Welcome back, Christy. Good to be back. We were talking about communicating with the uh, membership. Um, you have a library there. What other kinds of, besides the Dyer Botsford House, do you have any other cemeteries or monuments or anything like that that the society maintains? Um, we have another 
building, I guess, in our community, you'd call it. We have what's called the Kristoff House. It is a house, it's a stone house that was taken apart on a farm, dismantled, marked all the stones, brought it to town, and set it up in our uh, one of our city parks. Wow. And they rebuilt it, and it has the history of the Michael Kristoff family, and just, it's a... It's open three times of summer, the last Sundays of each of June, July, and August from 1 to 4. And basically, you can come and learn the history. And So what did the Kristoffs do? They were farmers in our community. Um, they were instrumental with building the Basilica. Oh, cool. Um, one of them was their son was in the Iowa legislature. So just... Just involved with the community and nice. did different things. Well, I was so impressed that you guys were able to save and restore the Dyer Botsford House. You had to have a lot of community help and support for that, I imagine, or did you get a grant, or how did that happen? I think they had some grants, but they also had a lot of support from the city, some of the local businesses. So they approached some of the businesses to sponsor rooms. Like our Ertl company sponsored a room, our our Flaming Jewelry store sponsored a room, um, the bank sponsored a room. So then they helped pay for uh, some of the furnishings, you know, the wallpaper and different things like that. Oh, that's a good way to do um, it. That's really nice. It was all done by local community members. The hours and hours of work that they put in is amazing. When I look through the binder, that shows the progress they really did a lot of stuff in there. Wow. I think it's, uh, for our listeners, I think it's important to state that even though the Dyer Botsford House has a collection of over 2,000 dolls, it's not just a doll house. Um, right, it is not just a doll museum. Yep. The history that we have in there of our community and just the vintage items, we have a hand-carved circus that's over 80 years old. Wow. Uh, one of our local pharmacists, built this hand carved circus the animals are hand carved it lights up it it is motorized the wow. the tightrope walker is going back and forth on a little wire the, there's a circus train that goes around he built all of that uh items wow. we also have a different doll houses we have a replica of our hudibor castle is what it was referred to. It was actually a farm here, and a man came from France, the Houdibor family, came from France, and he built his wife a 27-room house to look like the homes in France. And it's always been referred to as the castle. Well, we have a replica of that built down in, our, uh, in the basement of our historical museum. We have lots of advertising from local businesses. We have vintage clothing. Uh, we have a big circus wagon that a uh, man used to pull in parades here in town. Just numerous, numerous items. So there's something for everybody on the visit to the house. Yes, a lot of men don't want to come in and because they see Dow Museum. Yeah. But when they come in and they see all the other things we have, they're very glad that they came in and, and toured. Fantastic. So I would imagine that You've got the memorial building, and then you've got the house, the Dyer's uh, house, Dyer Botsford house. Are you running out of archive space at all? We're fortunate. The city allows us to use two rooms upstairs in City Hall. Oh, cool. So they're very large rooms. So we have a lot of our items in acid-free boxes in these rooms. The basement of the Dyer house, I have a storage area that I can store excess um, dolls and other items. We'd love to have more room to put things on display, but you know, we only have so much, only so big of a lot over there to yep. do that. Yep. So we did just actually um, open last year our garage. We built a garage behind the Dyer House, the Dyer Botsford House, okay. and that houses our circus wagon and all of our agriculture related items. We have a big steamer trunk in there from a lady who came here back in the 1800s. That steamer trunk is in there. We have some carousel horses that came off of 
carousel that the man who had the circus wagon used to have and just lots of other items out there. It sounds like you got some wonderful items for people to see. Uh, the reason we do. I, we have a lot of neat, neat historical, historical and vintage items. The reason I ask is because, you know, I'm wondering how you revolve those things. If you have stuff in storage, you know, and people come to the house, let's say, you know, in July or June, and they see whatever it is, will the house then be different a few months later when you revolve the exhibits? No, we everything we have on display, we keep on display all the time. We don't have any items that we, like, take in and out. We do decorate for Christmas, so if we, oh, that would you know, wonderful. host something over Christmas, then... There would be Christmas decorations out. Um, we have a vintage nativity set that's really cool. That's neat. Uh, and just some vintage ornaments and different things like that Do you get... um, that we've set out at Christmas. We actually have a Christmas tree set up all year round. We have a 1912 goose feather Christmas tree. Ooh. They took the quills from the goose feathers and dyed them green and wrapped oh. them around wires to make the shape of the tree. Oh, my goodness. And that is on display. It revolves. Um, the ornaments are obviously very old that are on there. Um, they're of German, Czechoslovakian, and Polish descent from the family that donated this uh, Christmas tree. Well, that's got to be one of the coolest things you've received from as a it donation. It is pretty cool. Yeah, it revolves, and there's a light that turns. And underneath the tree, there's actually a, an old phonograph. Wow. I don't know if it works or not, but you could actually have music playing underneath the tree as well. Fantastic. So it's pretty cool. With COVID, are you still able to allow volunteers? So if somebody wanted to volunteer at the society, are you able to allow that? Yes, yes. We have volunteers that come in. We're open. Our office is open on Mondays and Thursdays okay. uh, from 10 to 4. So we have volunteers. Some come in just on Monday afternoon. Some come in all day Monday, all day Thursday. It kind of depends on what works in their, um, in their schedule. Yeah. They come in and do genealogy research. They might sit down in the newspapers and go through items, you know, pulling out different things that we're looking for. If people do requests, like they say, hey, I, I had an article back in 1967 about my dad. Is there any way I could get a copy of that? Right. Well, if they can tell us closer to the date, we can go to that date and pull it out and then send it to them. That's wonderful to have sort of a pool of volunteers like that. That's great. Yeah, and then our volunteers at the house, they sign up to do, we are open the Dyer Bastard House is open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4 and Saturdays and Sundays from 1 to 4. So I have volunteers that do a 10 to 1 shift or a 1 to 4 shift. You have, uh, some do once a week, some do once a month, some do twice a week. It just depends on what their schedule is. Yeah. Do you have uh, partnerships with like local community groups? I, I don't know what they are, like Elks or you know, think like a Boy Scouts or something like that where volunteers or even corporate volunteers? No, not really anything like that. They're all just individuals that come in. When students need service hours, we might get some of them coming to do stuff. Like I had a student who needed some service hours and he helped me do, he's really computer illiterate. Yeah. Literate, so he put all the, the stuff in the computer for me, oh, you know, did all the inventory and helped me get things updated, you know, just to kind of help do some of that stuff. That's but, fantastic. Um, it just depends. You know, people will call and, and say they want to volunteer, so we, we'll, take, we'll take it. Come on in and we'll find something for you to do. Okay. Well, that's, that's what I was getting at is listeners... Um, be sure you support this society, and, and even with COVID, you can wear a mask, that kind of thing. Uh, call them, walk in, uh, and volunteer. Christy, how does the society interface with other societies in the area, like maybe the state or the county, regional, that kind of thing? Um, we can participate. You know, there's different, like, webinars and different things through our state historical societies. Um, they send us out a, a newsletter about different things that we can, you know, get involved in. Our county 
they're instrumental in helping with some of the funding through the county. Our Dubuque County uh, supports all of the local uh, historical societies, so that kind of comes through our Dubuque Society. I, when I was cleaning out some things, I found some stuff that pertained more to a different historical society. Yeah. So I called them and asked them if they would want it, and they took the items you know, to put on display in their museum or whatever they have. So, yeah, we kind of work back and forth on things. You know, we have one that's in New Vienna, the Heritage House. They come down and do research here looking for different things. And then if they come across something, then they also share information with us. So we kind of, you know, try to support each other and, you know, share different things. Does the state offer, like, maybe I'm a state society or, you know, a state agency and I have all these artifacts and there's no way that I can put them all on display. Do they farm those out or loan them to various societies? Not as far as I'm aware of. Our Dubuque County right now is, they are currently going through and weeding out. I just actually got something from them this last month. I went in that they were they weren't going to put on display anymore. Okay. So they, they donated it to us. Oh, fantastic. Um, we have a couple other pieces that when the, our Historical Society opened the museum, the Dubuque County Historical Society let us have them on loan. And now I'm in the process of getting it so that it, they're donated to us. That's great. So they're pretty good about working with you on different things. Or if I have questions, you know, if someone comes here looking for something, I can call them and see if they have information about it, if it's a county thing. You know, our, I, people want different things, and I call our local parish and see if I can, you know, look in their records to find different stuff, you know, regarding, you know, people who lived here. And it worked, everybody works pretty good together. That's great. That's great. In terms of publications from the society, um, what kinds of interesting books, historical books, has the Society published? Are they available on the website? We have actually only put together one book. Um, okay. It was our centennial book, but we are now in the process of working on, through with our chamber, we actually just talked about this last month, of putting something together for our 150th an anniversary. Oh, that would be great. So that would be something that would be available. I had someone just had recopied or had copies made or republished, I should say, republished a genealogy book of a family history. And we worked with that individual to put out there that, hey, if anybody wants this, if anybody is looking for this book, we are, you know, we, they paid for the publishing, and then they got the book. So we kind of worked that way with different people, too, to preserve the history of families and things like that. Yeah, that's fabulous. I want to remind listeners that the website for the Dyersville Area Historical Society is dyersvillehistory.com. Christy, this next question is about that website. For people that haven't been to the website, Can you tell us sort of what kinds of things are available for visitors to do on the website? Yeah, it'll give you information about what our hours are for both the Historical House and the Historical Society office, our address, what we have available. We also have, I think there's some few, it connects you to our Facebook page. Okay. You know, then you can go on there and see, you know, different things that we've posted We try to, you know, put a historical event or historical things on there as well as, you know, things that are happening. Then I really, one of the things this winter is my goal is our web page is going to be redesigned. Um, Okay. We have someone who's going to help, help me figure out how we can update it. And I'd like to be able to post a few more pictures and different things like that of things that are around the house. And that would um, be great you know, links to different things just to kind of update it. It yeah. hasn't been updated for a very long time, so. Cool, I'm looking That's forward to that. That's one of my goals for the winter. Members should be looking forward to that as well. That's going to be a great thing. So what's the easiest Yeah, you know, method? we don't want to put too oh. much stuff out there 
on the web because we want people to still come in here, yes. you know, to do their research and, you know, look things up. And there's no way we could put 36,000 obituaries out there, no. you know, and you can find them in different places, but we actually have the obituary that came out of the newspaper. So a lot of people call us and you'd be surprised how many obituaries we send to people mm. when they're doing their research. Yeah, they really contain a, a, you know, a lot of good genealogical information. They do, they do. And unfortunately, we don't put as much information into them now compared to what they used to. Oh, yeah, that's true. Huh? You know, they used to be able to, you know, you could know where they worked and what they, you know, did, and now you don't get that. You know, they're not as individualized, I guess. It just doesn't have all the information in it. All right. What's the uh, what's the easiest way for members of the public to donate to the society or that? Is it through the website or should they call? What's the best way to do that? The best is to call or email. I have people call every week who want to donate dolls to us yeah. uh, for the museum. And I just, I have to tell people, send me pictures so I can see what you have. Right. If, as well as artifacts, you know, we just had someone come in this last month and brought us some things from her grandparents and parents. She came here from um, New Mexico and brought us stuff, oh, wow. you know, because they lived here and had a business here in town. You know, I just got something in the mail today from one of the, it's a little bank bag from one of our local banks that his great grandfather used when he made his deposits oh, for his business. You know, good. so it, we're constantly getting things like that and, I have a hard time telling people no, yeah. so um, I have to see what you have and the size of it, you know, because we just, we're limited on what we can take. Yeah. So if anybody wants to donate, whether it's to volunteer or whether it's donate money or donate artifacts, um, you can call the society at 563-875-2504. That's correct, right, Christy? Yes, or they can email us at dyersvillehs at windstream.net. Great, thank you. People need to hear it. Any donations are tax-free because you're a 501c3 organization, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Yep, so people donate. Make sure that this stuff is preserved. Make sure that you give your time, your support to the society, and it's tax-free which is a great thing. I always have this question about when is history history? What or when does something become part of the historical society to tell the story? I came to that question because I started seeing things that are happening today, right? We have um, Native Americans, uh, we have a lot of immigration occurring and family structures are changing and we still have women's movements and changes in the local economy and things like that. How does the society stay current and how do you judge what to collect at this point? I pick up every week three, the three different newspapers that are published through our local newspaper. And then I have a volunteer that goes through them. So if there's something about a business that is happening, whether or not they expanded whether it's a new business, whether it's a business celebrating an anniversary, that information gets taken out and put in a binder. Obituaries. We take out all of the obituaries from out of four different newspapers. Wow. Plus, if we know someone has passed away and the obituary does not get put in a newspaper, we will look for them on the Internet, you know, to try to get that obituary from that person if it happened in another state or wherever. We also go on Ancestry.com, mm -hmm. and we look for information that way also that has been on there, you know, to help people. So pretty much every week we are pulling stuff. I'm on the Internet. Our, our chamber has a Facebook page, and they post different things. Our Dyersville Economic Development Corporation posts different things. We can pull stuff off of those sites as well and add them to our binders just to help preserve that information. So 
or every week we're pulling out different history that has happened. Okay, fantastic. What kind of current initiatives do you have going? I know you've mentioned a couple, but can you sort of summarize them? Um, one of the things we're working on right now is we're trying to, so our Dyer Botsford um, Historical House is 171 years old. So we are trying right now to get the paint on the porch done, redone. Okay. Um, we just did it six years ago. It's peeling. We need to redo it. So we are trying to, that is one of the things that will be in our um, newsletter this next year, mentioning that we're doing this. We've written some grants. We actually just received a grant, a partial one, to help. It'll pay for part of it, but we're going to repaint our porch. We can't, there's a lot of intricate detail, so it has to be painted. We can't, like, seal it in yeah. any way, yeah. you know, with any kind of siding or anything like that. So You can't let the um, weather get to that either. Right, right. So we just have to maintain that. So I think that is our biggest thing right now that we're working on is just the maintenance over at the museum, just getting things redone. And yeah. it's just a lot to do. You know, when you have an older home, that takes a lot of a lot of money to keep it going. Sure and does. How's the roof doing? Um, the roof has been replaced. Um, right. in the, I don't remember how long, but it's in good shape. Oh, good. So we're very fortunate. We're very fortunate. They've, they slowly did things over the years. So now it's just, it's time that we kind of do a few things too. So yeah, I suspect our house uh, is not on the historical registry. Oh, it was moved at one point. So it's not able to be on the registry. So we can actually wrap the windows. Okay. So we're, that's one of the things where the money is going to go for as we raise it to wrap around the windows that we can. We have a very decorative arch over the top of all of our windows. Okay. And so that would still have to be painted because we can't get that wrapped. So, but like all the windows have shutters, those so shutters are going to have to be repainted eventually. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. Well, I think you had so, your family out there painting the fence, right? We had our board members painting. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Our board members. My husband painted, um, helped paint inside, but we had board members painted the fence. We have three men on our board who are awesome. And the one actually takes care of all of our landscape or oh, our lawn cool. mowing. He helped with, um, we had someone who's a master gardener that helped us with all of our flowers. Um, and then our board member helped her. We have another, one of the board members takes care of all of the landscaping around our Kristoff house. And then when they said they wanted to paint the fence, they came forward and they did it. So Great. I'm going to look up that Kristoff house. I hadn't seen anything about that, so I'll be looking for that. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what's on the website for that. It's probably um, there. I'd have right. to look again. I know you, or at least I suspect you have a, a ready answer when people ask you this, but I think it's important for the listeners to hear it from you, uh, and that is, why is the society important to the community? Well, we're important because we're preserving the history of our community. We have a lot of, we have businesses that will call us and say, hey, do you have information about such and such when my grandfather owned it? Yep, we have that information. You know, so we pre we've preserved that history. You know, we have history going back to 1848 when James Dyer came here, yeah. you know, that is being preserved here, um, artifacts information. Um, we have a d copy of the diary from James Dyer's son who fought in the Civil War and he kept a diary. You know, we have copies of that. You know, we just have a lot of neat artifacts and information that I don't think people realize that we have. Yeah, that's why, that's kind of why I asked the question about how do you, how do you communicate to the, you know, for me, and I'm not asking to be critical, I'm asking because I see it as a difficult thing, right, for societies mm -hmm. to keep the public informed about, you know, what do we have in our collections and, you know, what are you interested in seeing and, you know, those kind of things. How are we, how are right. we doing against our strategy? That's very difficult. Right. And it's just, it's just important to preserve that, you know, yeah. that, that's our mission is we are preserving that history and, and it's available, you know, for people. 
you know, I have someone that wanted to know about a little town and I have found information for her and I'm going to scan it in and send it to her, oh, you know, fabulous. just, you know, helping people that way who want to know about stuff. And, and I think with COVID people found themselves more time at home. So I think they did start looking into their genealogy and more stuff that way. You know, we, we sent a lot of stuff last fall to people because I think they just were at home and they wanted to know that stuff. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. People are, are, trapped in their house and now they're thinking about okay maybe now it's time to do the research right that's we had a cool. lot of stuff donated last year because people were cleaning that's great i have a uh, one last question here and that is is there any other information or any kind of a message you would like the community or the members to know about or even potential members through this broadcast i might say if you know if you have ancestors that lived in our area, give us a call and we'll see what we can find for you. We send information all over the country. We have even have a guy in Germany that I have sent multiple items to, you know, mailed to him because he doesn't have, he, he's not real good on the computer because yep. he's older, yep. but he, we send him a ton of stuff all the time. He's always calling about different things. So anything we can do to help you with your research or if you just want to, you know, come in and volunteer or you want to look for your own stuff, we are here and we're willing to help in any way we can. So, Fantastic. yeah, just give us a call. Thank you, Christy Deitmeyer. I, I am so grateful you joined us today. I, you and your society are both really preservation oaks, and that's what this show is about. I've learned a lot. We went through a lot of different topics, and, and I'm hoping that the listeners find it interesting. It's a blessing how much you and your society does to help the community and your members. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's a great organization. Yep, sure sounds like it. Thank you. And sadly, we have to end our time with our guest, Christy Deitmeyer of the Dyersville Area Historical Society. Listeners, please stay tuned for my comments and wrap up coming up next. We'll be right back to Preservation Oaks with Sean Thomas Radcliffe after these important messages. Hello, I hope you're doing well and enjoying the program. Your support is a direct and vital investment in the programs that MicroStream Radio provides throughout the year. Whatever programs you enjoy remain alive and on the air thanks to contributions from generous donors like you. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Please take a few moments and show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. We thank you so much. This is Dave McFarland, director of the Montgomery County, Iowa Historical Society, and I love listening to Sean Thomas Radcliffe on Microstream Radio. <laughs> This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. And welcome back. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe. What a great society Christy operates and what a hardworking individual she is. So let's recap. Christy and I chatted about the Dyer Botsford Museum. The restoration of the house and repurposing it as a museum was done using a process where each local business sponsored a room in the home and restored it. I think that's a great way to do it. The museum is not just a doll museum. Men in the area. There are plenty of wonderment items for you to see in the museum besides dolls. Please come inside when you visit. For those of you who have not visited in a while, the Society has constructed a new garage behind the house. This is now a part of the tour and it's where circus artifacts and other things are now displayed. The Dyer's Botsford Museum will be decorated profusely for Christmas. It's a perfect time for a visit. 
Christy mentioned that on permanent display at the museum is a German Christmas tree from 1912 which uses goose feathers dyed green for the tree fronds and branches. I think that's very creative for a time when there were no plastics to create an artificial tree. Christy and I chatted about the purported haunting of the local library in articles I read from 2017. She has no further information about whether ghosts were actually exercised from the library building or not. COVID has affected both the society and the community, unfortunately. Volunteering at the society decreased, but it's now coming back to pre-COVID levels, thankfully. The society was closed between March and May of 2020, but it's back open now during the normal society hours. City Hall was also closed for a portion of 2020, and unfortunately COVID also caused the demise of businesses in the area. The society and the community are not currently under a health lockdown. The business community of Dyersville area were so kind with their donations in 2021. That was instrumental in helping the society weather the impacts of COVID on society funding. Christie discussed a curriculum first developed in 2019 to allow school-aged children to interact with the society and learn about how life has changed from the last century to this one. This curriculum was not able to be implemented due to COVID, but Christie intends to resurrect the plan as soon as COVID passes. I think that's great news for community parents who really want their children to be educated in the shared values of the community. The Society saw a distinct uptick in the volume of requests for assistance with genealogy research during the time when people were under lockdown and an increase in artifact donations. Christy believes this is a byproduct of people being sequestered in their homes for long periods of time. I like that reasoning. The Society is the only one in the area with a genealogy library where guests can sit and complete their research. The Society has published one book about the Dyersville area history, namely the Centennial Book. However, they're now contemplating publication of another to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the area. An objective Christie has established to be accomplished this winter season is to redesign and implement a new Society website. During 2021, the Society board members painted the perimeter fence of the Dyer Botsford Museum. An objective Christie has established for next spring is to repaint the Dyer Botsford Museum front porch, wrap the windows for added insulation and weatherproofing, and to repaint the shutters. All they need are adequate donations to make that possible. We learned from Christy that the best way to donate to the Society is to call them directly at 563-875-2504. We also chatted about the beautiful St. Francis Xavier Basilica, quite a beautiful building inside and out and well worth a visit to Dyersville. We discussed how the town of Dyersville began and how the Historical Society was started we talked about the Field of Dreams movie and set in the area. Who can believe that was 30 years ago? We also chatted about the Ertl Toy Company. Christy and her team of volunteers are staffing the Dyer Botsford Museum, the Memorial Building Society home, and the Christoph House every week to provide the community with a valuable window into their past. They can always use donations and volunteers. Thankfully, the Society enjoys great community spirit and assistance for projects the Society needs to maintain the records, the artifacts, and facilities. Way to go, Dyersville. Next year, if COVID leaves us alone, it'll be an exciting time for the Dyersville Area Historical Society. I congratulate the community on having the foresight to implement such a hardworking leader as Christy Deitmeyer. If you're listening in the Dyersville area, or if you're a listener researching family history in the Dyersville, Iowa area, and you're not already a member, please consider joining and supporting the Society. 
The Dyersville Area Historical Society's website URL is dyersvillehistory.com. You can reach them at 563-875-2504 or by mail at 341st Avenue, Dyersville, Iowa, 52040. I hope this information helps everyone understand how valuable the Dyersville Area Historical Society is to the community. Please help all you can by volunteering and donating to support them. The Dyersville Area Historical Society is truly one of our nation's preservation oaks. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Music used today is from Simba Bird, Scott Holmes, Tim McMorris, and timmcmorris.com. Microstream Radio is a registered trademark. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted by Microstream Radio. It cannot be commercially rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere for commercial purposes without the written permission of Microstream Radio. Thanks to everyone for listening. This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. We'll see you all next time for another episode of